On Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. To discover the best in events and performances, visit BlumenthalArts.org. I definitely think of myself as a conjurer. I think that as an artist, I think the process of being able to conceptualize an artwork or a piece that I want to make or something that I want to convey and to make those thoughts tangible by creating an object that can then communicate with a viewer is already a form of conjuring. Renee Stout is a visual artist who explores the mystical and rhythmic planes of existence. Her mixed-media, multi-sensory installations delve into spiritualism, soothsaying, magic, and spells. She creates fictional narratives with imaginary characters that trace her personal history and address contemporary issues of community strife and healing. Her work has been exhibited internationally and at the National Museum of American Art, the Smithsonian Institution National Museum of African Art, the Halsey Institute of Contemporary Art, and the Smithsonian Institution American Art Museum. In this episode, we explore Renee's journey as an artist, what we would experience at one of her exhibitions, and the conjuring of supernatural forces to affect change in the world. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Renee, thank you for joining us today. Hi, Mark. Thank you for asking me. How would you describe your art? Oh, that's hard to say. I was trained as a painter, but eventually I decided that I wanted to express myself in a variety of media. So I'd say now it's become pretty eclectic, and I work with a variety of media. So instead of calling myself a painter, I call myself a visual artist because I do painting, drawing, sculpture, photography, installation, uh, you name it. What would I see at one of your exhibits? If you came to one of my exhibits, you'd walk in and you'd see a variety of things happening at one time. There are going to be paintings on the wall, but there will also be tableau, installations, uh, photography, because I want, I want the viewer to have a wide range of experiences because I'm trying to tell a story. And I feel like working in a variety of media uh, allows me to do that and, you know, appeals to the senses of the viewer. At least I hope so. When I think about my exhibits that I've had, especially at my gallery here in D.C. in the past, what I always try to do is if you, when you step off of the elevator, you're facing these glass doors, so you're looking directly into the gallery at one of the walls as you step off the elevator, and I try to put a piece, usually, and I've done this for the past three exhibitions that I've had there, that makes you feel like you're walking either into a portal, like there would be a door or a window, somewhere that's symbolic of an opening into a world that I want you to step into. And then once you get in there, you look to the left and you look to the right, you just see a variety of objects that are instrumental in telling parts of the story that I want the viewer to to get. What are examples of some of the objects that you work with? Oh, wow. There'll be, let's say I can find small, like, window frames, and then that will become sort of a, a wall. Like, I construct a wall and have that window in the middle. And I want the viewer to feel like I actually cut a section out of maybe an architectural structure. Um, I want to hint at interiors, sometimes exteriors. I want the viewer to feel like they're moving in and out of spaces. I want to use found objects that viewers have associations with, personal associations with, yet I can bring new meaning to those things so that the works that I do, I want them to be multi-layered, and I want the viewer to be able to interpret them from wherever they're coming from. What stories do your art tell? 
Well, you know, I, I tell a variety of stories, but I think the main story is based on a character that is an alter ego, where I'm trying to tell the story of an African-American woman, because I'm an African-American woman, and there's a story that I'm trying to tell about a woman who is highly perceptive and who has knowledge of roots and herbs and has deep insight into human nature. And so she functions within the community as sort of an advisor, like a reader and advisor. And people will come to her when they need advice. And so the stories that I tell through my work are about her encounters with people, the problems that they present to her so she can help solve them. And I think what I've done is set up a character that functions as a person that I think is needed in the community right now and has always been present in African-American communities, except that it's always been hush-hush. And who is that character for you? Her name is Fatima Mayfield, and it's two names that I put together based on women that I encountered in my life. And the Fatima came from a woman who was living in a community that I lived in several years ago. She was a struggling woman, but she had a really nice personality, and she lived across a building from the art studios that I was living in, and we would talk across the street. When we saw each other on the street, we'd have a conversation. She's just such a, a pleasant woman, and because of her circumstances, and I admired the fact that she still had the ability to be a pleasant person and, you know, put a smile on your face whenever you encountered her. So I chose the Fatima in honor of her. And then the Mayfield, the last name, was from a woman when I first moved to Washington, D.C., from Pittsburgh, where I'm originally from. I discovered what they call a spiritual supply store. And I hadn't known about these things before I came to D.C., although later I found out we had them in Pittsburgh as well. But it took me to come here to find that out. And so the spiritual supply store was run by an old African-American woman, and they called her Miss Mayfield. And she would give people advice and prescribe herbs for ailments that they would have. And sometimes you would go in there to pick up something, and you would hear her giving advice. And as soon as you walked in, the conversation would get really quiet because it's almost like being in a doctor's office. And she's trying to be discreet so that person's business is not put out there in the street. But her name was Miss Mayfield, and I called Fatima Mayfield, uh, you know, that gave that name in honor of her as well. She is a conjurer. Yes, she was. What does it mean to conjure? Conjuring to me is the idea of having an intent and then focusing so intensely on that intent that you use your mental powers as well as what Miss Mayfield said, actually said was, Sometimes you need objects that become the props that help you focus your intent. And so conjuring is a mixture of thoughts and objects that help you to paint a goal that you're after or a change that you want to make. Do you think of yourself as a conjurer? I definitely think of myself as a conjurer. I think that as an artist, I think the process of being able to conceptualize an artwork or a piece that I want to make or something that I want to convey and to make those spots tangible by creating an object that can then communicate with a viewer is already a form of conjuring. Do you think of all artists as conjurers? Yeah, I do. Whether they think of themselves as conjurers or not, on some level, I think most artists are. Renee, are spirits real to you? Oh, yeah, spirits are definitely real to me. And the, and the reason why I say that, I'm not a religious person at all. As a matter of fact, I think religion is at the root of a lot of the problems in the world. So I don't, I, re, I don't really subscribe to any one religion hook, line, and sinker. You know, and I'm open to all religions because I think that they have some good intent, but I think what happens is when human nature gets in the way, it all falls apart. I do think spirits are real because... In my own life, just moving about my own spaces and, you know, in interactions that I've had, some things have occurred that I just can't explain, but at the same time, it's like there always, it seems to me there has to be some intervention from some other dimension. So, yeah, I accept that there is parallel universe or an unseen world that, that does affect our own. And that's all I'll say. It's just, I, I, can't, I can't articulate it. It's just something that I feel. Are there spirits with 
particular identities that inform your work? You know, that's the funny thing. I don't really feel that there are particular spirits with identities that affect my work. It's just like a certain energy in the universe that I think that I've opened my mind to and plugged into that is just guiding me and making me feel compelled to communicate my ideas through my work. Do you ever feel like you can tap into those energies and shape the world that we live in? I feel like I can do that. I feel that because I'm connected and I want to, um, I feel like I want to use my skills and my creativity to affect the world in a positive way. And because I've put that out there, that I want to do that, I do feel like there are forces that help me do that, whether it's I may need something to create an artwork that I want to make, and I might step out of the house to run an errand, and suddenly I'm led to break off from the path I intended for that day, and something that I needed, I find. That, that has happened, and, and I just chuckle when that happens, because I'm like, okay, you know, I'm on the right path, I'm doing what the, the universe needs me to do. Renee, your art has often captured moments that you describe as moments of possession. Oh, yeah. definitely. It's like when you hear an athlete say, you know, when they've had a good game, and they say that they were in the zone. I feel the same way. I I totally understand that. It's like some days you have an idea, you go into your studio. For me, usually music is involved. I'll put on music because it adds to the creative spirit in the studio. And I start working, and all of a sudden, everything comes together for what I'm trying to do. You know, I see it happening. And you just don't even realize that you're, you're like you're on another plane. You're, you're in another plane of existence. You do, you, it's almost like you've been possessed. You know, then you come out of it and you're like, wow, I did that? What music would we hear? A variety of music. I've always been open to music because mm-hmm. as a child, I think I really wanted to be a musician before I was a visual artist. And I remember being around seven or eight years old and asking my father for a violin. And he said, okay, but he never got it. But there was still always a creative impulse, and I always listened to music, and I always heard my mother singing songs, and there was always music in the house, which is probably why I wanted to be a musician. So when I didn't get the violin, you know, I've always had a creative impulse. And so I, pen, paper, paint was always available because my mother recognized that I was going to be a little artist when I was young, because she had a brother who was a self-taught artist. And so I just began creating that way. But music has always been important, and I've always collected music. You might hear anything from jazz to rock to R&B to rap. I just like all kinds of music, and it depends on what my mood is during the day or what energy I feel like I need to have in the studio to create. That's the music that I'll choose to help to you know, make that happen. And the energy of that music shows up in how you create your objects, doesn't it? It definitely does, to the point where I had a traveling show that traveled from 2013 to 2016 called Tells of the Conjure Woman, The Art of Renee Stout. And when the curator director of the Halsey Institute, you know, we were discussing, you know, the way I create. And when I told him, you know, I listen to music, and sometimes to the point where when I've completed a piece, on the back of the piece, when I'm signing it, I'll actually list the music that I listen to. And when he heard that, well, you know, we need, we need to make a playlist for your exhibition. So I actually made a disc of some of the music that I listened to and sent it to the Halsey. And they made it so that the viewer, as they walk through, could put on headphones and listen to what I'm listening to. You mentioned uh, the character Fatima Mayfield, a spiritualist, a conjurer. Have you ever cast a spell of your own? Way back, when I first discovered the idea of conjuring, I um, had a crush on somebody. I had to be in my, I'd say, early 30s. And so, you know, I put together all kinds of things, and, you know, I love New Orleans. So on my, one of my trips to New Orleans, I knew that I was supposed to throw whatever it was that I created into running water. So I went down to the Mississippi River and did this. And it was one of those things like, be careful what you wish for. Well, 
you know, I had sort of an interaction with the object of my desire or the, you know, focus of my desire, but um, it didn't go the way I planned. So needless to say, I kind of learned a lesson about doing things like that. Renee, you've shared that you express your art through alter egos. Why do you take the approach of using alter egos? In the beginning, when I first started doing that, I was much younger you know, I'm, I'm an introvert, and a lot of people don't realize that. And so I'm very private as well. And so in order to express some of the things that I wanted to express, I developed alter egos that I could always blame what I was saying, you know, on that alter ego. Like something I expressed in the work, I could say, oh, you know, Madam Ching, which was one of the first alter egos, who was also a spiritualist, a fortune teller, a root worker. Um, I could blame Madam Ching and then Fatima Mayfield, which she developed later on after I was in my 40s. However, what I feel is starting to happen is that as I mature, I don't feel the need to hide behind the alter egos as much anymore. And they simply, especially Fatima Mayfield, has come become sort of the vehicle or the character through which I can tell a story, like an author or an actress. And so now it's more like that instead of you know needing to hide behind it. Well, let's talk briefly about some of those former alter egos. You mentioned Madame Ching. Who is she? She was a woman that I first encountered in Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh's Hill District, which was the same area or neighborhood that the playwright August Wilson grew up in and was very influenced by the neighborhood he lived in. Well, Madame Ching was a woman that I encountered, a, a real woman calling herself Madame Ching, she used to live on Perry Street in Pittsburgh's Hill District. And the only reason why I knew that she called herself this was I had a boyfriend that lived on that same street, and whenever we would walk up and down the street, this Madam Ching was sitting on her front stoop. She was an older black woman, and the window in her house had a sign painted Madam Ching. And it was rumored that she had been an herbalist and a root worker and that kind of thing, but there was not much information about her, and people were actually afraid of her. Kids would were told to stay away from her. But the idea that this is what she was, I feel like the seeds of all the work that I've been doing come out of that encounter. And that's why the first alter ego was named Madam Ching. Why do you think you were drawn to her? The sense of mystery. People tell you, oh, stay away from that person. Well, why? (laughs) I want to know what that's about. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I didn't know at first, but then as I started studying more about African art and African religions, I made the connections between root workers, the hoodoo women, and all these kinds of things that have their seeds in African religions and philosophies and culture, and I started to understand some things about her, but that was only later on after doing some research that I became more and more interested in people like Madam Ching in black communities across the country. Another one of your early alter egos was Dorothy. Who is she? Dorothy wasn't so much an alter ego as a character, because early on when I first started trying to understand why people do what they do, my first subjects were probably my mother and father, who really had a real rocky relationship when I was growing up. And my mother was an introvert as well, but my father was very extroverted and very social, and that was a source of sort of conflict in their in their relationship because my mother wasn't comfortable around people to the point where now looking back on it, it's almost like, it, it, I'm not going to say it was a disorder because I can't, I'm not a therapist, but she doesn't really, to this day, doesn't really want to go out of the house or associate with people. And so for somebody like my father, you know, that became a problem. So you know, that was a source of friction in the household. And so... As I grew older, trying to figure out relationships, and then, you know, old enough to have my own relationships, my characters became a way for me to sort of work out the issues by creating the characters and making artworks based on their perspective. So that's why I created those characters, to sort of work through these extremes. You've described yourself as a highly perceptive and sensitive person. Is that ever a burden? Yes, I always say that sometimes it's a burden and a curse, and sometimes it's a gift. Because I, as a person who lives in the world, 
I want to understand the world. I want to understand people, and I want to be open to all people. But then sometimes, because you're highly perceptive, you can see too much. And it hurts to see some of the awful things that people do in the world, because I feel it deeply. How does it weigh on you emotionally? Well, you know, it, it's sometimes it's, it can be when it's too much at one time, it's even hard to, like, get out of bed. And you lay there, and you're like, okay, so let me get up and do what I need to do. But it's like, okay, what's going to happen in the world today? It's like I can't turn it off. It's really hard for me to turn it off because I see the world as a whole thing. I can't compartmentalize as well and say, okay, well, this is my little life over here, and none of this affects me. I feel like we're all deeply connected. And so I can have wonderful things going on in my life, but if somebody's, for example, the recent things that have happened in Las Vegas or the, you know, or the hurricanes, that's going to affect my way of thinking daily. It's definitely therapy for me. I do feel like my art is therapeutic. You know, it, it, it helps me work out my feelings because instead of getting really down about something, I have a, a way to transform those feelings into something positive in a way that then sort of generates my thoughts and feelings and then that becomes something that the viewer can look at and understand what I was feeling and share those feelings. Do you think the art is therapeutic for those who encounter it? I think it sometimes it can be when people, you know, are really open to wanting to connect with art or allow what an artist is trying to convey to resonate with them. I think art can do that for the viewer. But you have to be open to that. And I think that sometimes people are very open to what art might be able to convey to them. And then I think sometimes people are very threatened by art and feel fearful of art. And so if they shut down then I don't feel like the art communicates. Do you think what you do is more topical or more timeless? I think it's a little bit of both. I think that I deal with things that are happening in the here and now, but I think like a lot of times what I'm dealing with are human issues that are across time, not just now, but the same human issues that you know we were dealing with 50 years ago. Renee, you grew up in Pittsburgh. What were those days like? Well, those days for me, when I think back on it, were, it was interesting because when I grew up in Pittsburgh, it was voted one of the most livable cities, especially the funny thing in 84 and 85, it was voted the most livable city and 85 just happened to be the year I left. When I was growing up, Pittsburgh was like 80% white and roughly 20% black. And of course, we had other people from, you know, other nationalities there that were at the, mostly because we had lots of universities in Pittsburgh. So there were other people as well. But for the most part, it was the makeup was sort of black and white. And you could sense an undercurrent of racism, but yet it was, it wasn't on the surface the way we see it right now. I think that what helped as I was growing up, for the most part, is we had steel mills that were active. And when economically people are doing okay, you don't tend to see racism happening. And so everybody, you know, even if you could, you didn't really have a high school education, you could make a decent wage working in the steel mills so that people seem to be okay. But once the steel mills closed, that's when things started coming out to the surface. I think it was like a strange thing. It's like on the one hand... You know, I love the city that I grew up in, but on the other hand, I know about the things that weren't so great about it. Did you grow up in a household where race and race relations was a regular conversation? Yes. My father would talk about these kinds of things to us because he knew the world that we would have to grow up in. And one of the things that, there there are two things that he said to me that always kind of stand out. One of the first things he said He said, as a black woman, you are always going to have to work twice as hard to be considered in this world. You can't be mediocre. I have to work twice as hard. And so for my talents or my knowledge to be recognized. And the other thing he said, the only color that matters is green. 
So he wanted to say, you know, with the importance of how money influences things as well. You had an early encounter with art that set your life in motion. What is that story? Well, when I was in fourth grade, my fourth grade art teacher, Miss Aiello, I wonder if she's still alive. I often think about her, but she recognized that I could draw really well. And so she called my parents and told them that she wanted to suggest my name for Saturday art classes at the Carnegie Museum of Pittsburgh. And at that time, in the Pittsburgh public schools, they had art teachers identify students that they felt would be good for this Saturday art program. And so my parents thought that was a great idea. And so every Saturday morning, my father would take me to the Carnegie Museum, where we'd spend a couple of hours, me and some other students, hundreds of other students from Pittsburgh public schools. We would go through the natural history program, um, uh, natural history part of the museum, and look into the cases. And then we had an instructor, his name was Joseph Fitzpatrick, who coincidentally was my father's high school art teacher. And he was the one that would conduct these classes. And so we'd talk about art, tell us about artists like Picasso. And then at some point, we would go into the Natural History Museum and draw from the objects in the cases. And one of the things I encountered on one of those visits to the Natural History part of the museum was what they call an inkisi. And in those days, they were known as fetishes. But I don't know how many listeners have seen these things before. But if you go to the Natural History part of most museums, you may encounter them. But they are African objects that are ritualistic objects, and they are figures that have been carved that look like kind of human figures with nails driven into them. And they're power objects, actually. And what they are are vessels for the spirits of the ancestors, which they believe offer the living guidance. And once you drive a nail, you come to a person who would keep these in Kisi in the communities or the, or the village, you come for advice just like the root worker, you know, or the hoodoo woman, you would come to this person for advice, and they would consult with you, and then you were to take a nail, ask a request of the ancestors, and then the nail would be driven into the figure, and that would activate the power of the ancestors to guide you. And so when I encountered these, I didn't know anything about that. I was just fascinated by the aesthetics of it, the darkness of it, the nails, you know, I didn't know why these things existed, but I was fascinated, and that always stuck with me. And then when I finally moved to Washington, D.C., and encountered the Smithsonian's Museum of African Art, they had an extensive collection of these things with extensive research done on them, and I found out a whole lot more about them, and that's when I really became fascinated. And so when I went to Carnegie Mellon, I had been trained as a painter, so that's how I started my career. But I feel that these pieces that I, this piece that I saw at the Carnegie Museum, as well as the uh, ones that I saw at the Museum of Natural, I mean, of um, African Art, is what led me to want to work in mixed media. You mentioned going to school at Carnegie Mellon University and studying painting and then making this decision in 1985 to move to Washington, D.C. Why Washington, D.C.? At the time, my mother and father were, like like I said, having a rough time, and I felt it was time for me to go. It was time for me to leave D.C. I was 24, I think, 20, no, 25, I think, about 25. And I decided it was really time to get out of Pittsburgh. I didn't really know where I wanted to go, but I had a really good friend who had left Pittsburgh and moved to D.C. about two years earlier. And I used to come and visit all the time. And while I was in D.C. for those short visits, which would, like, usually be a weekend, I loved the idea that the museums in the Smithsonian were all free. So I would go to all the museums every time I came to visit. And D.C., it just gave me the feeling that it was a place that I could be an artist. And so when I left, I decided to move to D.C. and stayed with a friend until I eventually got my own apartment. And I continued to go to museums. And I got a job working in a thrift store. And then I eventually got a job as an after-school broker and teacher in a Montessori school. And I was working on my art at night. And then in the summer, when school was out, I would continue to work on my art. And eventually I started showing in D.C. 
Renee, your first breakout show was called Black Art Ancestral Legacy. What do you think of the notion of art being identified as black art? You know, it's like I understand the notion of art being identified as black art only because for a long time the idea that American art did not include African American or black artists was absurd. I mean, you have a whole country full of different kinds of people that has always been made up of different kinds of people, yet the art that you would see in the museum was predominantly done by white male artists. Even female artists of any race were excluded. And so during the 60s and 70s, when we were starting to become more aware of this kind of neglect, what started happening is museums and galleries started to have shows that showcased art that was done by different kinds of people. And so that idea that there was black art, that was needed as a, as a title of a show to make people understand that this is what this show is going to focus on. However, I feel like sometimes the labels can become a problem because if I'm known as a black artist and there is a show of black art, then what happens is, let's say, an Indian artist might say, or an Indian person who wants to go see some art might say, okay, well, that's black art. I might not understand that. That show is not for me. So sometimes I feel like labels can be limiting. So it's like I'm very conflicted about labeling things. You know, I don't, it's really kind of hard. Do you think of yourself as a black artist? I think of myself as a black artist only because I'm a black person and I make art. And so the art that I make is going to be from my perspective, but I'm also a human being. So I think that the issues that I deal with and the issues that I confront in my work are open to any human being. That first show, how did that change your career? That show was a large group show. And I think there were about 25 to 30 artists in that show of which I was the youngest. And it was the, the whole title of the show was called Black Art, Ancestral Legacy, The African Impulse in African American Art. And what the curators were trying to do, because there were multiple curators for that show, what the curators were trying to show was that even though there were many African American artists doing artwork, sometimes there are vestiges of that African aesthetic that still come through black artists that have never even set foot on African soil. And they wanted to sort of highlight how these things sort of occur. So that's what that whole exhibition was about. And it was my first museum show. And it brought like national attention to my work. How do you go about creating a life as an artist? From the outside looking in, you think of exhibits and relationships with galleries and residencies and grants. How do you piece that all together? What is a path for an artist? Wow, that, you know, that's, that's hard to say because every artist is different. And what happens, what, in my experience, it, you can't just give a formula for being an artist. There's just no way. There's just no way to do it. The art world is such a strange place and it changes. And I know that when I was growing up as an artist or when I was studying in art school, they didn't teach us how you go out to be a professional artist. All they did was taught you how to make art. You know, you had your classes in painting. You had your classes in drawing. There was no talk of what you would do as a professional artist and how you would go about approaching a gallery, how you would put together a portfolio to even show a gallery. There was no, that kind of talk didn't happen at all. So when I graduated in 1980, I had to make it up as I went along. And so I just approached, first of all, what I did, one of my first shows when I moved to D.C. was in the um, Martin Luther King Public Library. I started at small little venues like that and gradually built my resume up by having professional galleries invite me to do shows. You know, I was in group museum shows, so I gradually built up my resume and my career. These days, 
I was always told that longevity is what brought you respect as an artist. But these days, people can step right out of graduate school and they're art stars. So there's no formula. What doesn't the average person know about the life of a professional artist? That it's not glamorous. <laughs> you know, I've had a couple of friends come to shows and they see me standing there and people all around me and they see the artwork on the wall and everybody's standing around drinking wine and they see that as really glamorous. But it's a struggle. You know, I'm dirty every day. There's no glamour up in here. And it's a lot of hard work. And for me personally, I've had ups and downs in my career. I have periods where I make like very little money and I struggle along. And then I might have a year where I do quite well with a couple of big purchases of my work. And I've learned to know the differences between my needs and my wants in order to make sure that I have money to take care of keeping roof over my head and, and being able to buy supplies. So it's a balancing act. That's what people don't realize sometimes what it is to be um, an independent or self-employed artist. Have you ever thought about not doing it? I've thought about doing something else that might be more lucrative, but I feel that I, was, I would always make art. But then when I think about it, this is who I am. Creating things is who I've always been from the time I was three years old and scribbled on the toe of my Buster Brown shoes, Mary Jane's. I've always been this. I, I can't see myself doing anything else. Sometimes my, in my imagination, and, and my friends have asked me to do this, like, well, can you go get your degree in psychology? And sometimes I think about that, but I always come back to, I think that I, I need to do what I'm doing here in my studio at home. What are you working on now? What I'm working on now is a project that, is going to be a series of drawings. And there was a, a curator named Tasha Grantham who was working with these historians about a revolutionary named Jose Aponte from Cuba who got the idea for an insurrection in Cuba shortly after the Haitian Revolution. And he had created a book that was full of war strategies that he had collected and collages that he had made. And he used this book to talk to a sort of group of men that he had assembled in order to pull off this insurrection uh, against the Spanish in Havana. And what happened was one of the, his followers became afraid of this impending insurrection and went and informed on them. And so a group, he and a group of his men were put on trial and subsequently executed. The book he created was taken and they transcribed a lot of stuff that they made him describe in the book, but the book was never found. And so what I'm going to do is sort of pay homage to this book by not reproducing exactly what I think it was, but creating in my imagination what I think it could have looked like. Is your art where you want it to be? I don't feel like my art is exactly where I want it to be. I, I'm one of those artists that feels like I can always do better. You know, I, I work my hardest when I'm working on something, whether it be a show or an object. And I always look back on it and say, well, I could have done better. Or, you know, if I had more resources, I could make that better. So, you know, I'm, I'm my own worst critic. So I don't feel like my art is where I want it to be. And I always tell people that what they see of me is only the tip of the iceberg. Renee, if you had the resources that you wanted, what would you create? I think at this point in my life, what I would really want to create is films that are an extension of some of the ideas that I've been working on in my sculpture, paintings, drawings. I think that film is that next level and that layer that I want to explore. You know, as a as a as an artist, my work is so solitary in my studio. I don't have assistants. I make all of my own work. I do everything here. And in order to make a film, that you know, that's a project that I, I won't be able to do by myself. I'm gonna need people to help me. And, you know, if if I do that, I would want to be able to compensate 
the people that I'm collaborating with. And so I, I think that if I had the resources to make film shorts, which is what I want to start out doing, I think that that's what I would want to do next. You've created at least one before, haven't you? I did that with filmmakers that were uh, commissioned by the Halsey Institute of Contemporary Art at the College of Charleston for my exhibition, the traveling exhibition, Tales of the Conjure Woman. Mark hired two filmmakers to come to D.C., and what Mark's original intent was, every show that he does at the Halsey, he creates a video. Well, the video is usually, you know, the artist in the studio talking about their work. Maybe they show some scenes of the artist, you know, working on their work. But the filmmakers, when they called me, it was good to know that they were just as mischievous as I am. So we discussed the film, and I decided I didn't want to do that kind of talking head film. I wanted to do something that was going to be an extension of the show. And then, so I talked to them about my alter ego. So they came down. We brainstormed in my studio, and we came up with a sort of script. And two weeks later, they came back and shot the film in a weekend. And so, yeah, it's called I Can Heal. It's a remarkable film. Thank you. Renee, you talked earlier about being sensitive to what's going on in the world. What's on your mind these days? What's on my mind these days is I'm worried about where humanity is headed and the kinds of things that we're now willing to accept as normal and behavior that is being normalized. I think that that's what's foremost on my mind right now. And I am at the point where some of these things I want to deal with directly, and I already have dealt with directly in works that I've created, but I have a show also, another project that I'm working on that's going to happen in early 2018. I'm having a show at the John Michael Kohler Arts Center in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and some of the pieces that I want to do for that show will address some of these issues. If you could cast a spell on the world, what spell would you cast? Oh, that's easy. You know, definitely I'd want to cast a spell that makes people become like sort of, you know, introspective or self-reflective. I want, I wish people could be a lot more self-reflective so that they can realize how their own actions contribute to what's going on in the world and, and hopefully help them make the choices that helps make the world better. I mean, if we all did that every day, I think it would make a lot of difference. Renee, when you look back on your work years from now, what do you want your work to have been about? I want my work to have been about trying to contribute something to telling the story of who our society was at the time that I lived in it. You know, I want to offer a slice from my perspective for generations to look back and say, you know, as they look at the work of different artists, different writers, performers, or whatever, I hope that my work is part of that contribution to telling the story of what our society is right now. I think about these things, and I, it, what matters to me is making really good work that communicates something. Thank you, Renee, for your time today. Thank you, Mark, for inviting me to speak on your podcast. Renee Stout is a visual artist whose mixed media work has been exhibited at the Smithsonian Institution and internationally. Renee is a graduate of Carnegie Mellon University. And now, a personal word. When I hear Renee Stout talk about spirits and music and spells, I'm brought back to the streets of Rio de Janeiro watching African-Brazilian women in white crinoline dresses and colorful beads and headdresses dancing to rhythmic, percussive drums. I was 10 years old. We had moved from New York to Brazil. I really didn't know why at the time. I was the youngest in the family, and all I knew was that I had left my friends behind, and I was suddenly in a country where I didn't speak the language, and everything was strange and new. The food was different, 
The customs were different. The school I attended was different. It took a bit for me to adjust. I refused to talk to anyone the first month I was there, protesting a move to a new country without me having any say in the matter. We lived in Rio for just over two years. Here is what I remember playing paddle ball and volleyball and soccer for hours on Copacabana Beach. My brother and I tossing a baseball and catching it with a mitt, which Brazilians were fascinated by and could not do or understand. Drinking ice cold Coke sold by barefoot vendors in the heat of the summer, eating pineapples cut by machetes, and getting sticky mango popsicles all over my hands. Devouring delicious warmed pressed bread and butter for breakfast going to corner restaurants and having steak sandwiches with onions for lunch, listening to the Brazilian singer Roberto Carlos sing songs that sounded like the Beatles, government soldiers in green helmets carrying machine guns, reading English out loud in class, and getting a smile from my teacher, a young and attractive Roman Catholic nun. Brazil is this crazy country of money and wealth and beauty, and poverty and violence and corruption. There is the city of Sao Paulo in the south that is larger and more complex than New York, and villages in the Amazon jungle in the north that barely have had contact with civilization. The country is hot and primal and sexual. During Carnival, everyone comes out to play. In the dance and thrum and lunacy of Brazil are the practitioners of Candoble, a mystical religion derived from Yoruba and Bantu and brought to Brazil during the African slave trade. For centuries, candomblé was practiced in secret, cloaked in Catholic practices in order to protect its devotees from persecution. Candomblé means dance in honor of the gods. On Fridays, believers wear white in honor of the supreme creator called Olodumare, who is served by lesser deities known as Orishas. Fridays are sacred festival days days of purification. Believers sing and dance, summoning Orishas to cross over from the spirit world and possess the chosen. My memory of the Candoble were big boned women wearing white dresses and having a good time dancing down the street. Nothing to worry about there. The people I did worry about were the Macumba. They were African Brazilian witch doctors who practiced black magic on the streets of the city. They cut off the heads of chickens and drank blood, or at least I think they did. Just as I had been whisked away from New York to Brazil, the day came when I was whisked away from Brazil to Miami. A new life began encountering Haitian voodoo and Cuban Santeria. I don't doubt that Renee Stout senses the spirit world in her work. She accesses and summons and directs powers that animate her art. There is a dance with the dead and a playfulness about life in her installations. Her art does what great art has the power to do, invite us into mystery. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Thank you to my partners, Andy Goh, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.